Let's stand together and worship the Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's sing. seated. I hope you received a worship guide on your way in. If you're visiting with us, that's our little uh, information packet that we hand to you as you come in the door. But there's information in there that you don't want to miss. Also, we're asking every single person, if you're new today or if you've been coming here as a member 100 years, to fill out the little connect card in there, tear it off and place it in the offering plate. We would love to know every single folk, person that joined us this morning for worship. So if you don't mind doing that and place it in the offering plate later, we would love to, to have a record of your visit with us this morning. Let's turn our attention to the baptistry this morning. We're going to see someone baptized. Thank you, Pastor John. Good morning, church family. Happy Easter to you. And what a blessing it is to celebrate three baptisms today, two in our 915 service and one now at 1045. This is Whitley Aldridge. She's the daughter, 10-year-old daughter of Jake and Taylor. And uh, I've so enjoyed getting to know their family, and uh, Whitley's been processing what Jesus did for her and asking questions and having conversations, and it was so good a few Sundays back when she came out uh, in the lobby after one of our services, and Pastor Kyle, uh, I made the decision today, and we were able to celebrate that. So uh, the best and greatest decision she'll ever make in her life. And you know that's true if you've made that same decision. Whitley, we're so proud of you. 
and excited to baptize you as you go public. Baptism is an outward display of what's happened already in your heart. And so with that, Whitley, are you choosing to follow Jesus in baptism today because you've accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior? Whitley, it's because of your profession of faith that I get to baptize you as my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Would you bow with me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you offer us life in Jesus' name. That you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again, conquering the grave. Father, I thank you that you offer that life to us, forgiveness to us, eternal life. God, I pray, Lord, that for Whitley especially, as she's now gone public with her decision to follow you, that you'd bless her and guide her that you would use her and grow her into the godly young woman you have called her to be. God, I pray that her testimony through baptism would encourage others today that they maybe have never made that decision or taken that step to go public with their faith. And Jesus, we give you all the praise and honor today for you are alive and you are reigning and you rule and you're returning. And God, our hope is in you. So Father, turn our eyes to you this morning as we lift our voices. In Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. Stand with us once more.
today. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. We're going to continue to worship him. Aren't you thankful for the name that is above every name? The name of Jesus Christ. And uh, if they were to look for him in the, in the grave today, they wouldn't find him. Amen. King Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Let's continue to praise him.
the name that is above every name. Hallelujah. You can have a seat just for a moment. We're going to continue to worship him. We're thankful for this day, the greatest day in history, the centerpiece of our faith, everything that we believe in, the reason we're here hinges upon Jesus being alive, and he is. Hallelujah. We're going to worship him.
Praise God. Thank you, choir, John and Krista. Man, words cannot fully express and contain all that our God is. But that song does try and does a pretty doggone good job of it. Amen? Amen. Wow. The God we serve, holy, holy, holy. The one who is all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing. All-sufficient to meet every need. And who is, ladies and gentlemen, very much alive. Risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. Conquering sin, death, and the grave. Holla, hallelujah. It's so good to see you here this morning on Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I pray that uh, you've been blessed already in the course of our time together. And pray that as we open God's word, that it'll speak to you, that he will speak to you through his word in a special way. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you experienced a day that has changed every day for you? Have you experienced a day that has changed every day for you? Now, it could have been... Um, a good day. Maybe it was your driver's license past the test day. Y'all remember that day? That was a day that changed every day. Maybe it was graduation day. Maybe it was landed that dream job day. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was your first child or birth of a child day. Maybe it was retirement. Maybe it was empty nester day. Maybe it was a bad day. Maybe it was a day of Trauma or tragedy. Could have been a day of an accident or a diagnosis. Could have been a day of a loss of a loved one. There's a lot of issues on any given day that have the power to change every day. But nothing, nothing has the power to change every day. Like the day we celebrate today on Easter Sunday, the day that we celebrate the day Jesus walked out of the tomb alive, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. This day should change every day for you. I want to read what the Word of God has to say in Romans chapter 6, the first 11 verses, built on the fact that Jesus died and was made alive. And from the Word of God, I simply want us to ask two simple questions and answer these two simple questions. The first one, I can answer for you because the Bible answers it. The second question, only you can answer. And I want to encourage and invite you to answer it. Here's what the Word of God says. Romans 6, beginning verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. For death For death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. From this text, I want us to ask and to answer two simple questions. Both of these questions are built on the facts of this text. Here's my first question. Are you ready? What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? The Bible says, here's what Jesus did. Jesus died and was made alive. What did Jesus do? Jesus died and was made alive. I want you to listen also to the few verses from Romans 5 that make it even more clear like this. Verses 6 and 8 of Romans 5. It says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for, the don't miss this, the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one might dare even to die. But God shows, don't miss this please, God shows his love toward us, for us, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for 
us. Jesus died for you, friend. Jesus died for me. Why? The Bible tells you plainly, clearly, in black and white. Why did Jesus die for you? Why? Because God loves you. Out of his mercy, out of his love, driven and compelled by love for you, the ones he has made in his image. God loved you so much, he sent his one and only son so that he could die for your sin. You say, well, why did he have to die for my sin? Well, let's ask this question. Who are we according to scripture? Let me ask you like this. Are we righteous people? Now, not too many of you sound convinced of the answer to this question. I'm going to ask it again. Are we righteous people? No. Who did the Bible say he had to die for? The ungodly sinners, the Bible says. Now, who are sinners? Sometimes we get offended by that label, don't we? We don't like to be called that. By the way, that's not a feel-good term, but it's a true term for our state before God that every single man, woman, boy, and girl comes into this life breathing air sinful before God. You know what a sinner is? A sinner is someone, let me give it to you in two things. A sinner is someone who's failed to love God perfectly with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Kyle Walker has failed to love God perfectly with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And also a sinner is someone who has failed to love others as they love themselves perfectly. I, you, have fallen short of both of those standards. The problem is those two standards, God says his entire righteous law hangs on those two things. Loving God with all we've got and loving others as ourselves. And we've all fallen short of that. That makes us sinners to a holy God who's righteous and knows no sin. And in our sin, the Bible says that makes us enemies of God, estranged from God. That's who we are. Have you realized by nature this is who you are? Well, if that's who we are, then who is Jesus? I wish I had time to turn you ask you to turn to every place that the Bible speaks of who Jesus is, but I just want to recount for you, and I'll tell you what the Bible says. You can test me and look at this this afternoon if uh, you'd like to look this up. It says the Bible says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact representation of the Father's nature. The Bible says Jesus was in the beginning with God, and Jesus was God. The Bible says that everything that was made was made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made, and he actually fully even now presently sustains all that's been made, the universe, by the word of his power. This is who Jesus is. He's the one that was born of a virgin, the second person of the Trinity, taking on human flesh, lived among us a sinless life, and we beheld his glory, glory as the one and only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and and truth. This is who Jesus is, and he died for who? The righteous? Oh, no. He died for the ungodly, which is all of us. Have you realized who you are, and have you realized who Jesus is? Praise God. Look what his death provided for us. You say, Kyle, why do you have to die? Notice two things. Chapter 5 says, look at verse 9. It says, his death justified us by his blood. The problem with the sinner is we stand condemned before a holy God. Condemned before a holy God. The price that our sin required was the blood, the precious, priceless, sinless, pure, spotless blood of Jesus required to pay for the sin of the world. The Lamb of God shed his blood on the cross to pay for. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no possibility for the forgiveness of sin. It took innocent blood to pay for our sin so we could be justified. What does that mean? Declared righteous. Sinners declared righteous in God's sight. Why? Because again, he loved us. Not just justified, the Bible says, verse 10 of chapter 5, by Jesus' death, we've been reconciled to God by his death. What do you mean reconciled? Reconciled is a fancy way of saying you were in a wrong relationship with God by nature, but Jesus died so you could be in a right relationship with God. By the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, if by faith in him, receiving forgiveness from him, putting your life in his hands, you can be given life and made in a right relationship, peace with God, having been an enemy estranged from God. This is what the death of Jesus did for us. I love how the Bible says it like this. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. It's been called the great exchange. Jesus loved you so much. He said, listen, I will take your sin if by faith you'll receive my righteousness for you. So you can be justified and reconciled to God. Has that happened in your life? 
praise God, he didn't just die for us, but he also was made alive. Did you hear? Listen again to chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we've been are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Jesus didn't just die. He was raised to life. Romans 6, verses 9 and 10. I want to read them again. Listen closely. We know. Hear that. Paul says, we know. Is this something you know? I'm going to come back to that. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Praise Jesus. He didn't just die for us, but he was raised to life, made alive for us. Notice the fact that Jesus died here in verse 9. Do you see it there? Paul says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead. Is that something I want to ask you, if you're being real honest, maybe if we had a chance to talk to the side in a one-on-one conversation, you might be in the room and you might just be saying, Kyle, uh, honestly, I just don't know that I believe that. I don't know that I know that. I don't know that I am convinced of that, that Jesus is alive, that he's been raised from the dead. And I'm not here to argue with you, actually. Because did you realize no one has ever been argued into the kingdom of God? No one. So I'm not going to argue with you. I do want to testify to what the Bible has to say is true. For you to reckon with yourself with what is true. Listen, I can tell you that supernatural darkness on the day Jesus died came over the land from noon to 3 p.m. when the sun should have been at its highest and brightest, y'all. The S-U-N refused to shine supernaturally on the S-O-N who became sin for us on the cross. I could tell you that the earth trembled and the rocks were split and the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn from the top to the bottom. Not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. And I could tell you that dead saints walked out of the grave and appeared to many when Jesus died. I could tell you there was a Roman centurion present who there's no telling how many hundreds or thousands of people he had nailed the spikes through their hands and their feet responsible for crucifixion but as he stood by Jesus and as he saw the nails pierce his hands and his feet and he watched the sun go black and the earth shake he cried out surely this one among the thousands I've seen this one must be the son of God I could tell you that Jesus long before he did what he said he was going to do said over and over again guess what I've come to die I'm going to be buried I'm going to rise again before he actually ever even did it said he was going to do it was prophesied he would I could tell you all that but none of that is how you know that you know Jesus is alive so how do you know that Jesus is alive Paul says we know how do you know how do you know that you know Jesus is Alive. You know Jesus is alive, friend, when the fact that Jesus died and was made alive has changed your life. That's when you know that you know Jesus is alive. Has the fact that Jesus died and been made alive changed your life? When you truly know that these are true and you too have accepted the Jesus' death and life for you, you wake up different. You wake up different. You have a hope that you didn't have before. You start your day different. You dress different. You show up to school different. You'll show up to work different. You will talk different. You'll act different. You'll think different. You'll celebrate different. You'll suffer different. You'll husband different. You'll wife different. You'll parent different. You will retire different. You will even die different. You will take your last breath different if you've been changed by the fact that Jesus died and was made alive. It changes everything. And you know that you know, you know that if it is changing everything for you. Because let's be real honest, lots of people claim to believe that Jesus is alive. But deep down, they really don't believe it. Say, Kyle, why why or how do you say that? The reason why I say that is because I know they don't deep down really believe it because it's not changed everything for them. It's not changed everything. The Bible says that the Old Testament, God says it like this, Isaiah 29, 13, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts 
are far from me. God says there's a spiritual self-deception thing going on. There's many who claim with their lips one thing, but their lives say another. And I can tell you there are many who claim with their lips to be a follower of Christ, but following Christ has not changed everything for them. Deep down, they don't really believe it. This self-deception is a spiritual thing, and self-deception in life is one thing. In spiritual things, it's an even deadlier thing. Let me just tell you in life how easy self-deception is. You ready for this? 80% of all drivers on our roads and highways and byways claim to be above average drivers. 80%. And every single one of you know it's a lie. And some, some know they're not and say they're better. Some don't know they're not. They think they're a great driver. And they're not. Did y'all know that over 90% of people, when asked to recall their high school GPA, overestimate their high school GPA? Some know it and some don't. They just like selectively forgot so they can believe that's true. Spiritual self-deception is no laughing matter. It's one thing to be deceived about the things of life. It's one thing to be spiritually deceived about eternal things and the facts of what Jesus has done. You know that you know Jesus is alive when the fact that he's alive has changed everything for you. This leads me to my second question. I told you only you can answer. We've asked, what has Jesus done? Jesus died and was made alive. The question really that I want you to consider this morning is, what have you done? Let me put it like this. Have you died? And been made alive. Have you died and been made alive? Did you hear what the Bible says? Let me read it to you again, verse 5 through 8 of chapter 6. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, this is spiritual death and spiritual life. This is not talking about physical death and life. We know that our old self, who we once were, that sinful, ungodly, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, listen, we believe that we also will live with him. Have you died and have you been made alive? Physically speaking, I don't have to tell you that lots of people fear physical death. In fact, they did a survey in 2017 of American fears, and exactly 20.3% of people report being afraid or very afraid of physical death. I looked up what that was called. It's called thanatophobia. I had never even heard of that. But, I mean, you know it's a thing. Now you've heard of it. Now you even know the name. Thanatophobia. Lots of people are afraid of physical dying. What's interesting is that they also said about 20% of people are afraid of public speaking. And Jerry Seinfeld quipped, he said, hey, the average funeral, a lot of people would rather get in the casket than they would behind the podium and do the eulogy. I'm not talking to you about physical death. I'm talking to you about spiritual death. And you know what's interesting? And this is true. More people are afraid of dying spiritually than they are of dying physically. Now, you say, Kyle, what do you mean? My grandfather was 87 years old when he trusted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. All 6'6", size 15 shoe of him. It took me two other grown men in the baptistry to baptize him. He was the first person I was ever able to baptize. We called him Poppy. Poppy, why would you wait so long to follow Jesus? You know what he said? I'll never forget these words. He said, Kyle, I knew I'd have to change the way I lived if I chose to follow Jesus. Can I translate for you? Kyle, I was afraid to die spiritually. I was afraid to die and say no and deny deny myself and my way of life. I was afraid to not be my own master and Lord. I was afraid to put my life at Jesus' feet and say, you live through me and have your way. I was afraid of what he called me to do, what he told me to do, and living for him. I was afraid to die. More people are afraid to die spiritually than they are physically. Are you afraid to die? If so, what are you afraid of? What is... Dying spiritually to your old way of life, to sin and self. It's dying with Christ to sin. Let me just make that real simple what that is. It is realizing Jesus died for you because he loves you. Realizing Jesus died for you because he loves you, it means turning, turning from your sin. That word is repentance in the Bible. It's just you are going 180, you exit the interstate and go the opposite way. 
That's repentance. Turning. Turning to who? Turning to Jesus in faith, trusting him and his death for the forgiveness of yours and trusting that his blood will do for you what the Bible says it will do. And that means surrendering yourself to his lordship. No to you, the Bible says, Paul writes, I'm crucified with Christ, he says. I've spiritually died. My old way of life and living has been nailed to the cross. But yet, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. When we trust Jesus by faith to save us from our sin, our faith by the power of God spiritually unites us with Christ. His death becomes our death to sin. His death for us is applied as if we died. His blood shed is applied for us. Providing forgiveness, providing life. Have you died with Christ? I loved the movie as a kid. I still remember we went to the movie theater in Americus, Georgia, and we watched two movies back to back. That was really rare when I was growing up. Like we walked in, walked out, looked at the next one playing, and turned around and walked back in. That was awesome. I remember it was a fun night. Anyway, one of those movies was Cool Runnings. Have y'all seen Cool Runnings? Yeah, Jamaican bobsled team. They were a running team, turned bobsled team. And, uh, you know, so they go through all the obstacles and finally are uh, competing. I don't remember, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, if when they crashed at this point in time in the movie, if they were in the trials or actually in the competition or whatever. But uh, I just remember Bob Sled comes to a screeching halt. They're laying over on their side, survived the crash, but you don't really know it quite yet what their condition is until the guy in the front says to the guy in the back, you dead, man? <laughs> no, man. I love that line as a kid. You know, the question is, has there been a day you died spiritually? That you were crucified with Christ. You realized what he did for you. You trusted in what he did for you. You turned from living for you so Jesus could live through you. The best news is, right, that if you've chosen to die with Christ by faith, Jesus didn't just die, he was made alive. <laughs> this is why you don't have to be afraid to die spiritually, because Jesus was made alive not just applying his blood to cleanse you from sin, but offering you his life to raise you to life, to give you life abundant and eternal, redeemed and forgiven, made right with God. To know and enjoy the one who made you and loved you and to be with you, with him forever. So Jesus didn't just die, he was raised to life. By the way, there's lots of instances in the Bible of where people were raised back to life. Even Jesus performed from death to life. I don't know if you ever think about it, like for Lazarus, for instance, I mean, dude had to die again. You ever thought about it? Like, they just got to die twice. Not so with Jesus. His resurrection was irreversible. His death and life could never be undone. Yes, his blood was shed. Yes, he breathed his last. Yes, he gave up his spirit. Yes, his body was buried in a borrowed tomb. And yes, his grave was sealed with a stone and guarded by Rome. But I just want you to think about some questions. And I'm just asking logically. Could death conquer the author of life let me hear yes or no oh y'all oh come on now <clears throat> y'all with me i'm gonna ask you again could death conquer the author of life no. no think about it like this could a stone that jesus made stand in the way of its maker no could the one who said let there be light be held by darkness no, could an earthly tomb contain, really contain the one eternal, almighty, everlasting God? No. Listen, you might be in the room and you're like, well, I don't know that God exists. Well, listen, creation shouts and screams the creator's existence. I don't want to argue that one with you either, but I can tell you Abraham Lincoln had a great line. He said this, he said, listen, I can understand a man that if he's posted in heaven, looking on earth, not believing in God. I'd give it to that man. I'd understand that man not believing in God. But what I cannot understand is if a man or woman's posted on earth and can look into the heavens and not believe in God. I think deep down, even if you are struggling today with God, you know He exists. And if He exists and He made life and light and created everything out of nothing, then there's no stone that could stand in His way. There's no darkness that could hold Him. He's the one who spoke it all. He's in control of it all. He walked out alive. If there is a God and the creation shouts that there is one, nothing makes more sense than that Jesus is alive and that the grave is empty. 
How do you know that Jesus is alive? How do you know? If you've died and been made alive, ladies and gentlemen, you know. You know, because it's changed everything for you. Let me ask you this question. What's the difference between someone who calls themselves a, calls themselves a Christian versus someone who's a true, genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? What's the difference between someone who might just call themselves a Christian versus a true, genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, if we had to go to Wikipedia, which I don't recommend, but I'm going to do just because it's helpful today. This is how a Christian is defined according to Wikipedia. They say a Christian is someone that believes Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of humanity and whose coming as the Messiah was prophesied in the Old Testament. And according to that definition, they say that at least in 2021, 63% of Americans qualified or claimed to be Christians. The only problem with that definition used by Wikipedia is that according to that definition, even Satan himself would be a Christian. Satan knows those things are true of Jesus. He doesn't argue about those things. He knows them and he lives to fight against them. A true disciple, friends, is not someone who believes certain things about Jesus. A true follower of Jesus has had a day that changed every day. A day they died with Jesus and were made alive. Have you died and been made alive? Let me put it to you like this that may help and we'll finish. Lots of people think becoming a Christian works by addition. You know what addition is? You know, one plus one equals... Yeah. So, um, lots of people think, hey, I'm just going to add Jesus to my life. Man, Kyle, everything you've just said about Jesus sounds wonderful. He'll make my life better. Let me get some Jesus in my life. Let me add Jesus to my life. You know, like you add sugar to your tea. Y'all like sugar in your tea? It makes it sweeter, doesn't it? Yeah, Jesus make my life sweeter. Like sugar in my tea, let's add some Jesus. Hey, y'all like any cream in your coffee? I drink it black. I do like creamer too. Let me add some cream in my coffee like Jesus to my life, make my life better. Hey, let me add Jesus like salt in my food and make it tastier. Let me add Jesus like vitamins in my diet to make it healthier. Hey, let me add Jesus like a pet to the family to make life more interesting. That's not what following Jesus looks like. Jesus does not work by addition. Because all you're doing is adding certain beliefs about Jesus that haven't changed your life to a dead, spiritually dead, and dead-end way of living. So if it doesn't work by addition, how does it work? It works by subtraction and substitution. It works when there's been a minus sign in your life, a day you died, and you said, no longer me, Lord Jesus, but you. No to my old way of life, no to me as my master, and substitution. I'm not adding Jesus to my life. I'm letting Jesus give me life. And I'm crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live because Christ lives in and through me. Ladies and gentlemen, have you died and been made alive? And let me be real clear because this is the facts. We're all, if you've not died spiritually in Christ, there's a day coming. There's a day coming when spiritual death will happen. You say, Kyle, what's that? For any, anyone who's not spiritually died with Christ by faith, they're going to be separated from Christ and God forever, experiencing spiritual death of separation in a place called hell forever. The choice is yours whether that death comes or dying with Christ comes so that life can come. Because Jesus' death, dying with him, breaks the power and the penalty of sin so you can be made alive. The choice is yours. Have you died and been made alive? Has there been a day that changed every single day since? Not that you're perfect, but it is changed and is changing and one day is promised by the Lord Jesus when you see him face to face. You'll be changed fully and perfectly in that instance. John and praise team are about to come and here's what I'm going to ask you. There's a lot of you in the room that have died and been made alive. Praise God. 
Today is a day to celebrate that. It's a day to remember that. It's a day to go back to that day and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Thank you, Jesus. I want to worship. I want to say thank you. Maybe you want to get on your knees at the altar, say thank you, and celebrate again. Maybe stand where you are, lift your hands ready, just to celebrate the fact that you're alive, and you know Jesus is alive because his death and resurrection has changed and is changing everything for you. Worship him because he lives, as we're going to sing. But maybe there are some of you in the room that you said, Kyle, I might, I might not even have done addition. Or might, you might have tried that, but you know what, Kyle, I've never done subtraction and substitution. I've never come to Jesus by faith and laid my life down and asked him to live his through me. And today's the day I'm realizing that that's what I need. That's what I want. And if every cell in your body and every, every single slice of your soul wants that, listen, I'm going to ask you right now just to bow your head and close your eyes. Would you? Across the room, bow your head, close your eyes. And listen, if you're in the room and you need to do subtraction and substitution, Would you simply tell Jesus in your heart, you can borrow my words, you can use your own. You talk to Jesus with all your heart and you say, God, today I want to die to my way of life and living. Tell him you're done. You're exiting the interstate and you're turning from sin and turning from your way and you're turning to him. Tell him with all your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Say, Jesus, I'm trusting in your blood that was shed for me. Thank you for loving me so much that you died for me. Say, Jesus, would you cleanse me? Would you make me yours? I am surrendering to you as Lord. Be the Lord of my life. Have your way and live. Jesus, live. Jesus, live through me. Make me alive. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you've made that decision today, listen, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. But I stand here in our final song so that if you need to slip out from where you are, if you made that decision, you need to tell somebody. This is not a secret. This is the greatest decision you could ever make. Would you come tell me? Would you come kneel? We've got um, encouragers. If you just want to kneel and pray by yourself, you come and do that. If you want to talk to me, I'll pray with you. We want to be able to walk with you as you walk your first steps of life in Jesus. If you just want to come worship and celebrate, but if you need to tell and share that you've surrendered to Jesus today, you come tell me, come tell one of us, and we want to pray and we want to help God. Lord Jesus, I want to ask in this next few moments that you just give freedom to us to respond to you unashamed and bold and courageous because of what you've done for us on the cross going to the tomb and walking out alive God help us in full faith and surrender to you let you have your way because you're alive in Jesus name I pray amen would you stand with me church family we're going to sing because he lives and worship together you come and respond as the Lord leads you I'm waiting for you you come let's sing together God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my sin.
Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Really sing it out. All Life is worth the living just because Jesus lives. Let me be real honest. If Jesus wasn't alive, that statement would not be true. But Jesus is alive. And even the strongest, hardest trial and temptation you will ever face, trial, storm of life, because Jesus is alive. There is hope not just for today, but for tomorrow. And I pray that you know that hope. Don't leave today if you don't know that you know that you have that hope. God loves you so much. He sent his one and only son that whosoever will believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you today. and You get all the glory. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated just for a moment. I'm going to ask you, if you would, uh, to take that worship guide. And I don't know if I got one up here or not, but somebody can show me what it looks like. There it is. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, if you would, I want you to take this and with me tear out that portion. If you've not had a chance to do this, you can make some noise in church with this right here. All right. Take that, tear that out, and uh, take a pen and uh, jot down at least your name and uh, give me a number. Uh, if you are a family member here, uh, let us know you're here. We want everybody to do this. If you're a visitor, or first time, maybe a few time here visitor, but uh, haven't had a chance to let us know you've been here, do that. Give me a number I could reach out to you. We just want to connect you with our church family. So take a moment and do that. And uh, as you do that, our ushers are going to make their way down. As they come, let me tell you two more things real quick. Number one, April the 14th is a Sunday. I want to be sure that if you've not joined a Sunday school class, small group here, then what a day to check out all our classes. It's an open house. We're going to do name tags when you walk in the front, all right? We're going to try to have everybody wear a name tag, and then we're going to make our Sunday school classes available. They're going to do refreshments and food so that you can just visit and walk through, meet the classes, and decide, hey, this is one we might want to check out and visit. And the church will become personal, small to you in the sense where you get to know and be known. So check that out if you're not in a Sunday school small group. Second, our family fun night, April the 17th. It's a Wednesday night from 5 to 7 out here. Outside food trucks, fun, fun games, activities for kids and family. Don't miss being a part of that. Meet other people and enjoy the fellowship of being together as the family of God. Let me pray for us. Get this ready to drop in the plate. Let us know you're here. And uh, we'll finish out with worship. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you sent Jesus for us. Thank you that we can have life in his name. Thank you that life is worth the living because he lives. I pray that anyone does not know that they know that they know that, Father, they wouldn't walk out today without knowing that for sure, that truth that has changed their life. God, I pray that you'd be honored and that, Jesus, we would live with that hope. It would change every part of our lives as we surrender and walk by faith with you for your name and glory. And all God's people said together, amen. Yes, I'm going to be out in the lobby and slip out that way. You join me out there as we finish in worship. Hallelujah. Every voice will proclaim there is no high. Hallelujah. Age to age we will sing there is no high.
Amen. Praise Him. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's say as we do each week, as we go, we go to make disciples. Have a great day.